Professor Zhao, please, the floor is yours. Thank you for having me today. Uh, as a cognitive scientist, I've studied how humans perform in the conditions of sc scarcity. My work has shown the detrimental cognitive tax of poverty, and that is our cognitive function declines when we experience poverty, equivalent to a 13-point drop in IQ. Now, this drop is equivalent to aging 15 years from 45 to 60 years old. My colleague's work has also shown that poverty makes workers less productive and more prone to errors at work. In fact, a growing body of studies have shown a psychological trap of poverty. That is, poverty saps brain power, making it more difficult to escape poverty. Giving people cash is one of the most effective and cost-effective ways to reduce poverty. Basic income provides not only the critical financial resources to low-income individuals, but also freedom and dignity. My team at UBC and Foundations for Social Change have recently published a peer-reviewed article at the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, where we show that giving $7,500 to people experiencing homelessness in Vancouver, BC, improved their cognitive function and well-being within three months of the cash transfer. Over one year, these recipients reduced homelessness by 99 days and the reduced reliance on social services generated a savings of $8,277 per person per year. And that is a net savings of $777 per person per year. We also found that the cash transfer did not lead to increased spending on alcohol, drugs, and cigarettes. Instead, the cash transfer reduced substance use severity by 90% in our recipients. The cash was primarily spent on food, rent, transit, and durable goods. We've heard from our participants that this cash transfer gave them peace of mind so that they can think properly and make good decisions for themselves and for their family. Our study is not the first one to show the benefits of cash transfers. In fact, hundreds of cash transfers uh, around the world have demonstrated the same pattern of results improved well-being, improved health conditions, cognitive function, and food security. And in some cases, cash transfers led to reduced crime rate and reduced alcohol and substance use. We're currently expanding the cash transfer study in British Columbia so that they can benefit more people and lifting people out of homelessness on a larger scale. We want to scale up the project to benefit uh, more low-income individuals, as, as well as demonstrating that this can work in other regions in British Columbia. The need to raise the income floor has never been greater. Since more people are being displaced by the rising living costs and the devastating environmental disasters in Canada. In a recent national survey, 50% of Canadians are pessimistic about their personal finances. A quarter of the low-income households cannot pay for monthly expenses. This presents tremendous stress on people's mind, increasing the risks of a downward spiral into deep poverty, which will only cost us more. Bill S-233 aims to provide a guaranteed livable basic income to all Canadians. This can not only alleviate the financial strains, but unleash the vast human potential that's currently trapped by poverty. A livable basic income can make Canadians more productive members of the society and generate net savings for the government over the long term. This is a true investment in Canadians. In this spirit, we're actively looking at designing a guaranteed livable basic income project in Prince George, BC, with support from Mayor Simon Yu, Indigenous leaders, and stakeholders in the province. So in closing, I strongly urge the government to test the implementation of a guaranteed livable basic income as a national strategy to reduce the economic, social, and human costs of poverty. Thank you. Um, this issue of, um, of the guaranteed basic income being a disincentive uh, for work. Yeah, so for the work disincentive argument, uh, the empirical evidence argues otherwise. Actually, basic income has increased 
employment in a certain demographics. In a currently running Denver project, uh, basic income has increased full-time employment by 50 percent. So that's what the evidence says. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Question for Dr. Zhao. The recipients in your study generally represented a third of the homeless population in Vancouver, and it was noted they were mild users of substance, had mild psychiatric symptoms. Just wondering if you looked at all at more of the risk population so that you would have had a, a total study, and I'm just thinking of the higher users of substance, psychiatric pro problems, et cetera. Um, have you done any further research to try to get that groups, which possibly would give you a higher degree of credibility when you're talking to people who would be resistant to trying to implement such a program? That's a good question. Um, so we looked at individuals with moderate levels of use, um, just not severe levels of use. In fact, a lot of our participants have active addiction substance use issues currently. Um, we are expanding the project to see how the cash transfer will generalize to the broader population, but we have not included people with severe mental health or substance use challenges at this point. Now, I think the motivation for that question is to understand the potential risks of cash transfers to people with severe levels of substance use or mental health symptoms. Um, my answer to that is this cash transfer is unlikely to increase the risks of cash on these individuals because they already have access to cash as the welfare programs that currently exist. Um, $7,500 or basic income is not going to lead to overdose or increasing overdose because it really takes $10 or even less to overdose. Uh, it does not depend on the, the amount of cash they receive. Second, um, past studies have, have, past basic income programs around the world have shown that uh, basic income actually reduced reliance on alcohol and substance over time. And that evidence come from the Cherokee Nation in North Carolina. Over 11 years, the basic income in that community actually reduced alcohol and substance use. And that speaks to the, the, the other side of the puzzle, which is people use because they're in poverty or homelessness, not the other way around. Why now, and how would this assist people to deal with the current crises we're seeing? There is an emergency of homelessness and crisis in Canada. Um, the reason the homelessness count in Vancouver shows there's a 32% increase in the homeless population while the entire population of Vancouver only increased 3%. So the current approaches are failing, and failing significantly, so we need to try something different. Basic income is an irrational investment to reduce homelessness and poverty effectively. Um, the biggest pushback I've heard is increases in taxes, that people think it's not fair to use my tax dollars to pay for the poor. The reality is that that's not the case. If we implement basic income, it will only affect the top maybe 5% of the income earners. It won't impact the taxes of the vast majority of Canadians. That's number one. Number two is basic income actually reduces our taxpayers' money. It's cost-effective overall. It's less than what we currently spend on poverty. So I'd like you to talk a bit more about why why you are advocating universality. And I know there are different ways to calibrate that, but why, why don't we just do a more targeted approach? Find the people in the downtown east side, all of them, and give them the cash transfer, but don't give it to anyone else. Um, the targeted approach are both ineffective and in, in, inefficient. Um, it's, it ended up, ended up costing us more over the long run because um, that's what we are currently doing. And what we see, this is not working at reducing poverty or homelessness. Um, a basic income is more effective and cost-effective over the long run. 